Hello and happy Saturday. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Not long ago, we read an email from listener Ava who was responding to our episode on the Nutcracker and suggested we do something similar about the Rite of Spring. I mentioned that former host of the show had done one on the Rite of Spring riot, and I was not sure how far it went beyond the riot itself because I hadn't listened to it in a while. Now I have listened to it. I think maybe I had not listened to it ever (laughs) because a lot of it felt like new information to me. The episode does indeed talk about Rite of Spring as a piece of music, its influences on both music and ballet. So we are pulling it out for today's Saturday Classic. This is from previous hosts, Sarah and Dublina, and it came out on June 29th, 2011. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Sarah Dowdy. And I'm Dublina Chakraborty. And today we're going to be doing a listener suggestion. So dance teacher Emily wrote in to suggest that we cover the Ballet Russe. And she said she couldn't guarantee us an exhumation. She knows that's one of our favorite topics, as it long has been. But she also said that the material really sold itself. There are great dancers. They're great composers. There's an influential impresario. Plus, there are a lot of scandals and mental breakdowns and some pretty salacious performances, too. The Afternoon of the Fawn, I think that's all I have to say there. If you if you know about dance, if you don't, you can go look that one up on your, on your own if you want to. <laughs> She's not going to get into the details. But what we really got drawn into was the promise of a riot here. We, you know how we love those. On May 29th, 1913, there was a riot during the debut of the Rite of Spring. And this was different from the last artistic riot that we podcasted on. You may remember it, the Astor Place riot. And that one wasn't about the work, which was Macbeth. That Pretty was the standard work in question. Mm-hmm. It was about the rivalry, rather, between the two actors about class conflict, and about Anglo-American tensions as well. Yeah, this one, though, is about the work. It's the premiere. It's about the dance and the music, and even the costumes get people enraged. All shockingly, and at the time, disturbingly different and new to the audience. That was what set them off in the first place. But before we get to the people involved, we're going to be talking about a few of them, the composer, the choreographer, the um, patron of the arts we mentioned, or before we start talking about the work, just try to imagine a piece of music and a dance that just was so outside of the norm, so outside of what you were used to, that it infuriated you to the point of getting out of your plush red seat and screaming at the stage and and getting really, really upset, yelling and causing a ruckus. I mean, just, just try to get in that mindset before we get going. Yeah. And once you have that going, we'll start off with a little bit of background. So when the Rite of Spring premiered, All indications suggested that it would be a huge hit. First and foremost, it was written by young superstar composer Igor Stravinsky. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. It was choreographed by the beloved dancer Vaslav Nijinsky. And of course, it was staged by the hottest ballet company in Europe at the time, the Ballet Russe. A complete smash since Sergei Diaghilev started it five years before this. Yeah, and because he's the man who founded the company and because he brought together the people who were involved in creating the Rite of Spring, it's only fitting we talk about him. I really think that all three of those men we mentioned could be their own podcast subjects. They have very interesting lives, but going to condense it a little because we're talking about the riot, not everybody involved. But Diaghilev was born in Russia in 1872 to landed nobility. And he had, um, I guess, kind of a sad start to life. His mother died only a few weeks after he was born. His father was a colonel. uh, But his stepmother really was an influential presence in his life. She encouraged his artistic inclinations. And he had a really happy, luxurious upbringing. The family, for instance, had an apartment in St. Petersburg, a country estate, and a provincial 20-room mansion. And they were really friendly and open. They hosted people. They had folks living with them. I think I, I saw in one account the either the estate or the 20-room mansion had a an outdoor table, a porch table that seated 50. So you can imagine the kind of upbringing this this man had. Yeah, and his family was really generous, but unfortunately that generosity caught up to them. They went bankrupt, and Diaghilev had to support them while studying law. But he also indulged in his artistic side once in a while. He started hanging out with a group of sophisticates he met through his cousin-slash-boyfriend. 
Yeah. Not something think that you think that would have a slash. <laughs> yeah. So this group made up some of the core members of the eventual Ballet Russe. So after graduation, Diaghilev decided he would become a composer instead of a lawyer. He would follow his dream. Pursue that artistic inclination. And at this time, one of the preeminent Russian composers was Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov. And classical music fans will know him as one of the five or the mighty handful, a group of young composers who decades earlier had tried to get Russian music back to its roots. They took inspiration from things like Russian folklore and fairy tales, and they scored the imperial ballets and operas. Yeah, so Diaghilev got this meeting with uh, Rimsky-Korsakov, who at this point is sort of the godfather of Russian music. And he has his work completely dismissed by this this old master. And he does sort of stick up for himself a little bit. I think he actually is kind of smart. He, I mean, and I mean that in a bad way. He, <laughs> I think he tells him, you're going to regret what you said. It's going to be printed in your biography someday, and you'll be so embarrassed. And by then, it'll be too late to take it back. So I mean, just imagining this young man saying this to, to the master. But he did stop composing. So I guess he took the lesson to heart. Diaghilev decided that was not his career track, probably for the best, because his true talent lay in management. He decided he'd become a patron of the arts, not an artist. Though, of course, he had to he had to be clever about that because he was not a wealthy man anymore. If you're going to be a patron of the arts and not have your own money, you've got to be resourceful. Yeah, so after a few years of staging artistic exhibitions in Russia and a job at the then bureaucratic Imperial Theater, he took his show on the road. For one thing, he did this for a couple of reasons. For one thing, he was patriotic. He wanted Europe to know his country. But he also knew that just as all things French were all the rage in Russia at the time, Parisians were also enchanted by the idea of old Russia, its opulence, its exoticism. And so he thought that it would be an easy sell. Yeah, they had a romantic idea of what Russia was or what it is Still. So in 1909, Diaghilev pulled the best dancers from Russia and formed the Ballet Russe. And the company's early years really capitalized on that perception of Russia as exotic and romantic. And if you look up some pictures from the costumes, for instance, at this point, you can you can tell that the flyers, they're very they're almost erotic in some cases. And um, the epitome of that aesthetic, that romantic, exotic aesthetic, was the company's principal dancer, Vaslav Nijinsky. And he eventually became Diaghilev's lover. And Nijinsky was the son of dancers. So he had grown up in this environment. And he was really famous for his leaps, almost like he could fly. So when he debuted in in Paris and in the rest of Europe, it was unlike anything people had ever seen before. And I mean, the same goes for many of the other dancers in the company, but Nijinsky in particular really stood out. The third member of our trio also came in near the beginning of this whole story of the Ballet Russe. He was also young and also, obviously, Russian, Igor Stravinsky. Now, Stravinsky was the son of a famous operatic bass, and he had grown up just behind the Imperial Theater, so kind of an auspicious place to grow up if you're interested in music, I guess. He took piano and music theory, and his house was filled with music. And theater, too. But still, when it was time for school, he studied law and philosophy. That seems to be a theme here, the study of law. All these would-be lawyers. But while at St. Petersburg University, he showed some of his early works to someone that we have heard of before, the father of a fellow student, none other than Rimsky-Korsakov. So Rimsky-Korsakov gave him a better reaction than he had given to Diaghilev and actually took him on as a private student. So the story turned out a little better there for him. (laughs) Definitely. Well, Stravinsky obviously displayed some more talent at composing, but Rimsky-Korsakov also helped him get some gigs going, too. So he started having performances, started having his music performed. And Diaghilev came into the picture in 1909 when he attended one of these performances and uh, heard Stravinsky's music and decided he wanted to commission him right away for the Ballet Russe summer season. So got some music for that. And then for the 1910 season, he commissioned the Firebird. And I mean, of course, this is probably one of the most famous ballets. It's it's absolutely one that's staged by most companies, I think, pretty frequently, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Even my 
ballet company I was in in Northeast Alabama when I was growing up did a production of The Firebird oh. every year. Were you in The Firebird? No, I wasn't in it. Oh, okay. I was in The Nutcracker, though. Okay. Does well, that count? Yeah. That's good <laughs> enough. Different composer, completely different ballet. <laughs> Never mind. Moving on. But anyway, this made Stravinsky blow up overnight. And then the next year, it was another hit for him and the ballet Russe with Petrushka. And in this one, Nijinsky danced the lead. But all the while, while Stravinsky is working on Petrushka, he's also working on something else, something that has a very modern sound, as we're going to learn, but something that's ancient, too, certainly has ancient roots. So we're going to have to go back again a little bit to, to explain. Stravinsky also wanted to make something uniquely Russian. He was also patriotic, like Rimsky-Korsakov or Diaghilev, and he really liked fairy tales and Russian legends especially. So he had grown up summering in a small village called Ustelug, and villagers would still come out and celebrate the harvest and the planting during during his youth. And they'd celebrate with festivals and dances, and they would sing songs with their untrained voices and play homemade instruments and really just have a, a good time. And it, it produced a very unique sound that sort of captivated Stravinsky. So he wrote The Rite of Spring to try to capture that celebratory chaos even though in the ballet's case, it's not just a harvest festival. It's not, it's not um, an entirely happy occasion. It's a pagan human sacrifice. Spoiler alert, in case you, you didn't know what happened at the end of the Rite of Spring, we got to mention it. The Chosen One, who is a young maiden, dances herself to death. So it's a disturbing story of, of celebration. Yeah, and to achieve that haphazard, distorted sound of the celebration and to imitate the untrained voices and the homemade instruments, Stravinsky knew he'd have to manipulate the traditional instruments of the orchestra. So he paired them up in odd combos. He would have one group play triplets while the other one played quadruplets. And most memorably, he moved some of the instruments so far outside of their range, they became unrecognizable. So those are just a few things he did to achieve that really unique sound. And here's what the Paris audience at the 1913 premiere first heard. So that's a very unusual sound. And a composer who was in attendance at the premiere, Camille Sanson, basically said, what is that? What instrument is that? And his seatmate told him, it's the bassoon. And Sanson was supposedly so scandalized by this information, <laughs> he reportedly said, if that is a bassoon, I am a baboon, and <laughs> walked out. Um, so he did not like hearing the bassoon played in this eerie unusual register at all. Well, and that wasn't even the only instrument that people had trouble with. There were some other strange sounding instruments that chimed in as well. There was an English horn, an E-flat clarinet, a bass clarinet, and actually a contemporary San Francisco symphony musician has described the sound as a, quote, jungle, just to give you an idea of what it what the impressions might have been like. So people were hissing. They started to yell. Some were cheering. Yeah, a few folks liked it. They, they wanted to keep hearing it. Then the first dance tableau opened and the music made a kind of terrifying transition. Yeah, so that's scary stuff. And, and you've just heard the music, but we're going to talk about the dance, too. What was going on on stage with this pounding, frightening music? The dancers weren't gracefully pirouetting about. They were grouped in a circle. They were jumping up and down with both feet together. And it, it looks painful. It, it looks very violent. A Nijinsky dancer later recalled, quote, with every leap, we landed heavily enough to jar every organ in us. And it and it looks like that. It, it looks heavy and, and uncomfortable. But because the dancers were also doing this move where they rest their heads on their hands and, and switch hands and, and pitch their heads back and forth, some people started shouting, get them a dentist. So people were, were not only upset by what they were hearing, the strange bassoon noise and, and all of that, but what they were seeing. And a third issue was the costumes. The dancers weren't wearing these scanty, form-fitting costumes that, you know, some people at the time were going to the ballet to see that. <laughs> they, you know, they wanted to see dancers and, and see the how they The classical, moved. the pretty, the you know, the really beautiful costumes. Exactly. The, the, the tutu kind of mm -hmm. get up. And um, 
these folks were wearing tunics. They were wearing long, fake braids. They had padded lace legs. And and you can look up these costumes, as I mentioned, but uh, the best way to picture it is almost like buckskins. They're, they, they don't look graceful. They look very primitive. And people, they hated it. They did not like that aspect of it. Stravinsky panicked at this point, and he starts to head backstage. Diagolov and for his part, flashes the house lights at this point. Trying to calm people down. But the orchestra kept playing, and Diaghilev must have guessed that something like this would go down. He he hadn't mentioned that fear to Stravinsky or Nijinsky at all, but he had told the conductor, Pierre Monteau, to keep playing no matter what. So, so the orchestra just keeps on playing the music, which must have been difficult because there's some crazy rhythms in the Rite of Spring. I, I have to imagine it would be tough to play if, if you couldn't hear what you were playing. But that wasn't the only problem. Yeah, I mean, what about the dancers? They couldn't hear either, and it makes it pretty hard to dance if you can't hear the beat of the music. So Nijinsky got on a chair and leaned out to call off the numbers. He yeah, was from basically backstage. counting for them. And Stravinsky held his coattails to keep him from falling. He was leaned that far out. And the police were, of course, called in. And uh, there's a really good quote, I think, from Harvard professor Thomas Kelly describing the effect of the music on the audience. He said, the pagans on stage made pagans of the audience. And it, I mean, we have to wonder who were these people? What this is now a classic piece of music. It's a um, it's a ballet that was certainly influential. Who were the people who just couldn't stand it? And it was long assumed that they were just kind of old fogies. You know, they wanted to see, like we mentioned earlier, the the classic tutu and and the pirouetting. But people didn't go to the ballet russe for that kind of experience anyway. And recently, um, one of the latest biographies on Diaghilev has shaken up that assumption that that these were the old fogies said that they were actually the the avant-garde, the people who were at the head of trends, but they felt like this piece of music, this dance just eclipsed even them. They didn't want to get left behind so violently. It they seems. were one-upped in edginess. They were. So, of course, the Rite of Spring doesn't sound quite so shocking now, and that's because a lot of later 20th century music was influenced by it. PBS actually hosts this great series by the San Francisco Symphony called Keeping Score, and Sarah and I both watched it, and the program calls Stravinsky's score an artistic revolution, something that redefined 20th century music. And one of the symphony's musicians even calls it rock and roll. And I think why it doesn't sound so shocking to us now is because it is very familiar. You, you'll recognize it in later classical music, but in other music forms, too. I mean, even if you don't listen to it and think, that's rock and roll, I mean, it, it clearly has an effect on, on where music went for the, the rest of the century. And it certainly defines Stravinsky's work. I mean, after this, the Firebird might have made, made him blow up overnight, but this defined his career. And he did, of course, go on to enjoy a very long career, probably making this even more impressive that he had something like this so early on. He went on composing in the 50s and 60s. He started composing 12-tone music, and he lived until the 1970s. Actually, the recordings we heard were conducted by Stravinsky. Yeah, and this work didn't just influence music, it also influenced choreography as well. Uh, the choreography of Nijinsky here was really influential. It, I mean, if you look at it, it looks like modern dance. That's what I thought when I first read about this at well, as well. When you see it, I mean, the costumes, the movements, everything kind of reminds you of that. But because the Rite of Spring was only performed eight times, and because Nijinsky had a mental breakdown at age 29 and ended up spending the rest of his life in and out of asylums, the choreography was, until recently presumed lost. Yeah. In 1987, though, we have this really interesting sort of forensic dance story. The Joffrey Ballet restored the original choreography, and they brought in a dance historian and an art historian. And those two drew from reviews and from dancers' quotes and from drawings and photos and even from Stravinsky's notes on the stage direction, which had sort of general instructions like there are this many groupings on the stage, but not exactly what they were doing. To to get that information, they finally found this score with choreographing notes, and it was discovered in 1982. And to me, the idea of reconstructing a dance 
is so – it's almost impossible for me to, to comprehend. Yeah, it's one of those instances where history and art meet so clearly. I think it's it's really fascinating. But when watching the restored ballet, you also get a peek at what the costumes would have looked like in action. They were designed by Nicholas Rarick, and they look primitive but also really modern at the same time. And the fact that people would go to such trouble to restore a ballet really just speaks to the effect and the importance of the ballet russe on dance. Yeah, after Diaghilev's death in 1929, the the Ballet Russe disbanded, I think, it almost immediately. But his employees branched out across the world to start some of the preeminent companies of today. The American Ballet Theater, New York City Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, they're all direct descendants from the Ballet Russe, as are companies everywhere. So listener Emily, who we mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, said that there'd be no exhumation in this story, but there actually is one of sorts. In February of this year, the BBC reported that some footage of the Ballet Russe, the only known footage, that is, had been discovered mislabeled in an online archive. And Diaghilev, I mean, the reason there was no footage before is because he had prohibited filming of the ballet since he didn't think that it could do his movements justice. Yeah. So... This so is... it's an artistic exhumation. There's no body involved, but some dance, you know, close enough. I'm, I was pleased by, by discovering this and getting to watch it. It's a rehearsal, so it's, it's, not, it's not the rite of spring. It's, it is the nice costumes, and it looks very proper. But still, it's the ballet russe, and it's, it's all we got. And I just want to mention, even if you haven't ever seen this ballet or um, you don't really even go to ballet or listen to classical music, you probably are familiar with the Rite of Spring because it is maybe most famously associated with Walt Disney's Fantasia. There's, of course, a long extended sequence of the Rite of Spring with the dinosaurs. The uh, You know, it's, it's kind of a sad part of Fantasia for sure. I don't know if I've ever seen Fantasia. Oh, no. I know. Seriously. Oh. Sarah, look, Sarah looks so shocked right well, now. I'm sure I have like a VHS of it <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> if you if you still have a VCR, I'm you can for that. You could look up. You could look up this part online. I mean, it's it's not it's not the um, the part that you normally watch with Fantasia, like the dancing hippo or Mickey and the broom. But it's still a pretty pretty memorable scene in Fantasia. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. (laughs) 